Okay, today we are on our final message of the series, Growing Pains. How many of y'all have enjoyed this series? Um, this is really cool. The Lord's been placing on my heart to write this series into a book. So right now, I've started that process. God is working on me with that. Uh, but I believe it's very beneficial on growing in the Lord. And growing means it's going to be hard. Spiritual maturity is going to be hard. Why? Because you're going to have people come against you. There's going to be testing and trials. And so the point of this series is to teach you that maturity means that you're going to outgrow the old environments you used to fit in. Your old way of living, the old habits that used to control you and consume you, now you have matured through Jesus Christ. And I got to be honest with you, the Lord placed this sermon today on my heart a while back, but he told me not to preach it until today. So I'm excited to finally share it with you. The title of today's message is Growing in the Vision. Growing in the vision, because the Lord has placed a vision over your life. There is a destination for you, a purpose for you to walk into, to glorify God. And guess what? The devil is going to try to attack you over and over and over again, because he's going to want to stop you or try to stop you from entering into that vision. Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18 states it like this, where there is no vision, the people perish. The people are destroyed, meaning you don't know where to go in life if you don't have a vision. If you don't know the direction that God has given you, and so I want to challenge you right now, what is your vision? Write it down. What is the vision that God has given you over your life? Where are you going? Where are you going? What has he spoken over you? What is the purpose that he has for you? In the end, do you even know the vision that God has spoken over you, or are you just going through life feeling stuck? feeling like you're in a rut and you don't know what you're doing. You don't know why you're at the job that you're at. You don't know why these problems are coming into your life because you have no direction in life. There is no vision. The people perish. Habakkuk chapter two, verse two states it like this. Write the vision plainly on tablets so that when you read it, you can run. And I love the wording there, meaning that when you read the word of God, the vision that he's placed over your life, you, you doubt the process. You stay stuck a little bit and say, okay, over the next few months, then I might do something. No, he says, read it and run. When God has confirmed it for your life, it's time to go. You don't have to have all the answers. God will make it clear over time, okay? So looking through the Bible, there's one person who knew what it was like to um, get this really big vision from the Lord that seemed bigger than him. It was a man named Nehemiah. So if you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and turn to the book of Nehemiah. And I love his story because his story challenges us to always believe in the vision that God has for us through the attacks, through the obstacles, through the people that we face and believe that God can still do the impossible. But if you don't know too much about Nehemiah, let me give you some background information first. About a thousand years after the time of Moses, the city of Jerusalem is now in a desperate state. Because if you know the history, you know that they have been destroyed by the Babylonians. King Nebuchadnezzar came in, destroyed the temple of Solomon, and then he took a lot of the people of Jerusalem and deported them into the city of Babylon, okay, the empire of Babylon. They were in bondage in Babylon for the next 70 years. Can you imagine being in captivity for the next 70 years? Some of us complain to God about a week right? Some of us complain to God, God, it's been two weeks and I'm struggling with this or this is happening in my life. God allowed this situation to happen for 70 years for them to understand that, hey, following God is better than following myself, than living for me. Following the ways of the Lord will protect me. But when I walk away from God, I walk away from God's protection. And then again, if you know the history, you know that the Media Persia Empire took over Babylon, and eventually the Persian king allowed the Jews to go back to the promised land, to go back to the city of Jerusalem. Now, wouldn't you say amen? How many of you would go back to the promise? Only a few of you. Okay, only a few of you would go back to the promise. We're going to pray on that? Okay. But here's what's crazy out of the story. Out of 3 million Jews, only 50,000 decided to go back home. Out of 3 million Jews, only 50,000 of them decided to go back home. Why? Because we become very comfortable in our dysfunction. We can become very comfortable in our bondage. We can become very comfortable, listen to this, in our misery. Some of us complain on a daily basis. I can't stand my job. I can't stand where I am. I am in misery. And when the Lord speaks, okay, I got a way out of this, you say, no, no, not for me. 
I'm not going to go there because I'm so comfortable and used to the misery that is in my life. And I want to make it very clear today, okay, that comfort is a sad deception. You hear me? Like comfort is a sad deception because comfort will tempt you to stay where you are instead of walking into the promises that God has for you. You'll be comfortable in misery. It's crazy to me. And as a pastor, I have so many people come up to me and they said, well, pastor, I had this vision to start this clothing line for the Lord. I was going to glorify him. But you know, starting a business is pretty risky. So I, I, I didn't do it. And I'm staying in a job that I hate going nowhere. Or maybe the Lord placed upon you visions and dreams to move to a new state, to plant something bigger for the kingdom of God. And that was exciting for a time, but you kind of gave up on that dream. And you just stayed where you are, and you're like, okay, I guess, I guess I'll just stay here because moving is uncomfortable. And I see it too within marriages. I see a marriage start to fall apart, and at first, you know, you say you want to work on your spouse, you want to work on yourself and, and grow your connection in a better way, but Get this, people become comfortable becoming roommates in the same house. Isn't that crazy? People become very comfortable within a marriage. I'm going to come home. I'm going to do my own thing. I'll be on the phone. You be on the phone. We'll watch different things. We'll go to separate rooms, and we'll live like roommates together. And at one point, at one time, you had a passion to change that, but guess what? You became comfortable with it. And so then you started saying stuff like this. Well, I guess it is what it is. Comfort is a sad deception keeping you stuck in something when God wants to take you out of that to help you grow and mature for the promises that he has for your life. But looking at the story here, okay, eventually the Jews, the 50,000 that went back to the city of Jerusalem, they rebuilt the temple of God. But listen to this. Every time they started to rebuild the wall to protect Jerusalem, the enemy would come out of nowhere and attack the wall. And so the wall would fall down. And they were never able to build up this protection. And as long as they couldn't build up the wall, they were vulnerable to an attack of the enemy every time. And I realized that this is spiritually what the devil wants to do to you. Think about it. The moment you met Jesus, you had an encounter with Jesus, his strength gave you strength to build your life, to rebuild your life on him instead. But then what did the devil do? Oh, wait a minute. You're moving? Oh, wait a minute, you're moving by faith now? You used to be very comfortable in your dysfunction. You used to be comfortable in this. I used to kind of lie to you. Now you believed it. Now you're starting to move. And so what happens? The devil sends attack after attack after attack after attack. I hear it all the time. Pastor, I just got baptized here, and uh, life is kind of crazy now. Yeah, that's how it's supposed to go. We didn't put that on the sign-up sheet, but that's how it's supposed to go. It means you're doing the right thing. We probably just left everybody for baptisms today. They're, Please stay for baptisms. It's going to be great, Okay. It's meant to be this way because now the enemy sees you as a threat. And so he's going to send attack after attack because the devil knows if he can keep you from rebuilding your life on Christ, you'll always be vulnerable to his attacks, to his schemes. Listen to this. Proverbs chapter 25, verse 28, like a city that is broken down and without walls, meaning leaving it unprotected, is a man who has no self-control over his spirit. He never listens to the Holy Spirit. He gives in to everything that feels good in the moment. He allows anger to consume him. He allows addiction to consume him. He brings everything into his heart, and then his heart becomes dark because he's not covered by the word of God or the Holy Spirit. And so he has no self-control over his spirit, and he sets himself up for trouble. And so my question for you today is if if there's a lot of trouble in your life, is it because every time the Holy Spirit tells you no, you don't listen? Because you want to do what you want to do and what feels good in the moment, where you want to go, who you want to be with in the nightlife, and, and you're giving in to all of these things. And I'm telling you, the devil doesn't want you to rebuild your life on Christ. Okay. And so It became a very devastating time for the people in Jerusalem. They rebuilt the temple of God, but they didn't know what to do about the wall. And then a man named Nehemiah got a special burden from the Lord. And he received a special burden from the Lord to complete this crazy vision that was bigger than him, but would save a lot of people. I need you to understand that about a vision from God. The vision from God over your life is not just to impact you. It's also to impact everybody around you. Even to save the people that come against you at times. You never know what the Lord is doing. So what can we learn 
from the story of Nehemiah that we can apply to a vision that God has placed over us. Point number one is this. Prayer is essential. Prayer is essential. Let me say it like this. If the vision you have is not bigger than you, meaning you can accomplish it by your own strength, it is not from God. You hear me? If the vision you have is not bigger than you, then it is not from God. Because when God gives you a vision, he's teaching you to trust him because only he can do it. But this also means that you can only accomplish a godly vision when you spend time in prayer. Prayer is essential to be able to hear the voice of the Lord. And I'm telling you today, the creator of everything wants to speak to you. And it'll give you clarity on what to do. So the story begins here in Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. And it says, these are the words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaleah. I, Nehemiah, was in the capital city of Susa in the month of Keslev. This was in the 20th year that Artaxerxes was king while I was in Susa. One of my brothers named Hanani and some other men came from Judah and I asked them about the Jews who had escaped captivity and still lived in Judah. I also asked them about the city of Jerusalem. And they answered, Nehemiah, the Jews who escaped captivity and are in the land of Judah are in much trouble. Now listen to the wording here. They are having many problems and are full of shame. Have you ever felt that shame before? Because the Lord placed something in your life and you felt like you messed up over and over and over again. Let me encourage you today. You will see that promise come as long as you keep getting back up. Because you only fail when you quit. And a lot of times God will allow you to uh, see disruption in what he has for you so that you can learn a new lesson. So that you can learn from that. How many times have you gotten back up and said, well, I'm never going to do that again. I'm never going to talk to this person again about those things in my life. I'm never going to go after a relationship like that again. I'm never going to pursue me over God again because it was a disaster for my life. You learned a lesson that now is getting you ready for the position that's coming. Isn't that amazing? But in the time of dysfunction or things falling apart, we feel that shame. And they felt the shame because the wall of Jerusalem was broken down. And its gates have been burned with fire. Now, watch this, because Nehemiah is hearing this about God's people in Jerusalem, and all of a sudden, he gets this spiritual burden placed on his heart. He said, when I heard about the people of Jerusalem and about the wall, I sat down and I cried. He said, I was very sad. I fasted and prayed to God of heaven for several days. So this leads me to a question I get asked a lot as a pastor. How do I know God is speaking to me? How do I know that God is telling me to do this? And so let me just make this as simple as I can and give you some powerful truths. The first thing to understand is this. When God speaks something over your life, it will never go against his word. It will never, ever go against his word or his character. Sometimes I've had people come up to me and say, you know, God told me to be with my girlfriend, and we're going to live together, and we're going to do all these things. And then later, I'm like, no, he didn't. No, that's the devil. That's what he's been telling you, and you've been giving into some temptation because those are the things that you want right now, but you got to make a commitment. There's a commitment because God makes a commitment with you. You know what that commitment is? He would never leave you or abandon you, and that's true love. That is real love. That is a choice that would change your life forever, right? But what God speaks in your life will never contradict the word of God or his character. The second thing is this, and I love this, God brings confirmation. Have you ever had one of those mornings you're just praying to the Lord, you open up the Bible, and you get a word, you're like, thank you, God. I needed that word today. Then all of a sudden, you had a friend call you and said, hey, I just thought about you today. Have you seen this verse? And you're like, I just read it this morning. I just read the same verse this morning. What does that mean to you? It's God getting your attention. God's showing you a revelation. And what I love about this, too, is that God will also open up the doors, the right doors at the right time. So let me say it like this. If you're trying to force a door open right now, maybe it's not from God. If you're trying to make something happen right now, if you're trying to make the relationship happen, the job happen, the opportunity happen, maybe it's not from God or maybe it's not for right now. But do you trust God in the process? The third thing is this, and I love this. No matter what battles you face, there is a peace from the Lord beyond comprehension. Have you ever had that? I remember, you know, moving and doing these crazy things in evangelism. And people are like, you're going to have no money. And I'm like, yeah. 
I got Jesus. But, but you're not going to have, like, anything to back up. I got God, you know? Like, well, what are you going to do? I don't know. Like, I'm just, I got this peace, and I know that he's speaking this to me. I don't have all the answers, but he is the answer. And he confirmed it. And I know that this is what he wants me to do. But as you can see from the story, another way that God speaks to us and, and makes us move is he puts a spiritual burden on your heart. It's a spiritual burden because when you encounter Jesus, when you encounter God, he not only changes your life, he changes your heart and your burdens. Have you noticed that? The moment you gave your heart over to the Lord, he started to change your burdens. Maybe you didn't care for people before. Maybe you said, I don't like people. I don't want to talk to people. I don't want to be around people. And now you're crying over them. That's what God did to me. I'll be honest with you. I didn't really care to be around people. I was selfish. And then the Lord started to work on my heart. And I remember telling my wife, like, I'm crying. <laughs> I don't know why. Like, I was <laughs> devastated because I felt like they were falling away from the Lord. God was chasing or changing my burdens. Maybe, listen, you used to watch these old movies. Listen to this music, and it didn't bother you before. But now it bothers you. Why? Because you have a burden to do what is right, and the Spirit of the Lord is yelling on the inside, do not allow this darkness back into your heart. Because do you know a lot of us feel depressed because of the things we're allowing in? The things that we allow into our mind and our heart on a daily basis, first thing in the morning, instead of being in the Word of God, we're listening to all these other things, these devastating things, what somebody said about you instead. How's your day going to go? You're mentally checked out because now that's going to run through your mind over and over and over again. You have this burden, but God will place a spiritual burden on you to do what is right. You can't shake it. You're going to dream about it. It's always going to be in the back of your mind, okay? So pay attention now. He gets his, his spiritual burden from the Lord, and then we see how Nehemiah prayed. Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 5 and 6, then I prayed this prayer, Lord God of heaven. Listen to the wording. You are great and powerful. God of heaven, you are great and, and powerful. You are the God who keeps his agreement of love. What I love about his prayer is that he's also reminding himself that what God speaks will always happen. God never breaks his promises. That is his character. When he speaks something over your life, it's going to take place. He's reminding himself, God, you will do this. You are great and powerful. You are mighty in every way. You are the God who keeps his agreement of love with people who love you and obey your commands. Please open your eyes and ears and listen to the prayer your servant is praying. Now, look at this. Before you, day and night. He prayed this day and night. He was persistent in his prayer life. You know why? Because he believed that God would speak back. He believed that God was going to reveal an answer over his life. How many of us pray every now and then, once a week? I ask people all the time, you've been praying? Yeah, yeah, I've been praying, Pastor. When did you pray? Over my food. That's the last time you prayed? Yeah, but I prayed that God would bless me with it. What would you eat? Fried chicken. Okay, so <laughs> we pray to God over these things. But he was persistent in his prayer because he believed that God was going to respond, that God was going to reveal something that was amazing. He prayed day and night, I'm praying for your servants, the Israelites. And he says, I confess the sins we Israelites have done against you. I am confessing that I have sinned against you. How did Nehemiah pray? The first thing he did was glorify God. God, you are all powerful, almighty. Is that how your prayers sound? Because it's very easy for the first thing for you to say in the presence of God, God, how about that new car? Hey, God, I need some money this week. How about that, that house, that relationship? Do you ever just start your prayer life out with God? You are so wonderful. I understand that I'm not worthy to even speak your holy name, yet you allow me in your presence to have a relationship with you. He glorified God. And then again, he was persistent in his prayer life. He believed that God was going to speak back. And I said this last week, listen, the enemy is also persistent in attacking you. And so you need to be persistent in your prayer life because that's how you're on guard and hear a word from God before the enemy even attacks you. So he prayed day and night. He also did what? He confessed his sins. 
He realized the wrong in his life. He confessed everything that was going on. And then he says, God, but you can do the impossible. And he asked the Lord to do something supernatural in verse 11. So Lord, please listen to my prayer. And listen to the prayers of all the other servants who are happy to honor you. Help me today as I ask the king for help. Make him pleased with me so he will be kind and give me what I ask for. For at that time, I was the king's wine servant. Nehemiah is reminding us of something so powerful. Here's an amazing revelation for you today. Prayer is a stress reliever. Prayer is a stress reliever. Well, pastor, I, I, I pray every now and then, and I don't feel like my stress is going away. And if that's you today, see, I, I realize too, for a lot of us, it's very tempting to pray one time, but then run to our idols instead over and over again. Because we're searching on TikTok and we're searching on Google how to relieve the stress in my life, the anxiety, the, the fear that I have. And so the world is going to tell you, well, just get distracted. It'll help you. Go ahead and, and go towards entertainment, right? Be distracted. What's going on? Or, hey, hey, you really got some deep internal struggles going on? Why don't you go ahead and get high? Just get high. Just, just numb the pain. At least you don't have to think about it. Or you can go towards that bottle. Because isn't that what you grew up in? Or you saw around your life, and it's sad because you become a ghost in your own house, becoming a drunk because that's the way you cope with things, and your own family cannot talk to you. He's angry today. He hasn't had a drink. Some of you have grown up in these chaotic environments. Get this. Some people are running to a relationship after another relationship after another relationship, even though they know this is going nowhere because they need to feel some worth in their life. And they're chasing a relationship with people who will abandon them instead of chasing a relationship with Jesus Christ, who will never abandon you or hurt you. See, the world is going to offer you a lot of idols, but these idols just distract and they numb the pain. Only Jesus can heal it. Only Jesus can relieve the stress that is over your life. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7. This is Paul speaking to the Philippian church. And I want you to write this down. Don't worry about anything. What did Habakkuk say? Write it down. Run with it. <laughs> Don't worry about anything. But pray and ask God for everything that you need, always giving thanks for what you have because you belong to Jesus Christ. And God's peace, I love this, will stand guard over your thoughts and your feelings. Jesus can correct your mind the way you're thinking. Some of you are so burdened and it's running over and over and over in your mind. And then Jesus shows up and says, stop it. Stop reminiscing on the past mistakes. I've freed you from that. It's time to move on and grow. It's time to take my hand and let me show you everything that I have for you. Jesus himself, the Holy Spirit, guards your thoughts and your feelings on the inside. And his peace can do far better than our human minds, than our human methods. Only his peace can come into your life. Only Jesus has the answers. And so... Looking at the story of Nehemiah after all this praying, what did he ask for? He asked for favor. And so he goes in front of the king, and immediately it says that the king noticed a burden on him and asked him what it is that you want. And so he, he gave his, his reasoning. I would like to go to Jerusalem and, and build a wall for the people of God. And the king had compassion on him. Here it is. And, and the king also set up everything that he needed. He said, not only will you go and rebuild the wall, I'm going to give you everything that you need. That's how God opens up the doors. That's what I mean when I say God is the one who opens up the doors. Not only does he open up the door, he sends people into your life and says, I got what you need. I got everything that you need to make this vision come to life. Just let me know. And I'll give it to you. You don't have to force the door open. God answered his prayer. Now, here's a very powerful revelation too. Um, and this is a spoiler alert with the story, if you don't know the story that well. How long did it take Nehemiah to build the wall of Jerusalem? 52 days. That's not long. 52 days, because you're going to learn that he went through a lot of attacks, 
a lot of opposition, a lot of things came up against him when he tried to rebuild the wall. But I do not want you to miss this. It only took him 52 days to build the wall, but he spent four months in prayer preparing. He spent four months in prayer preparing for a job, a vision that would be completed within 52 days. And so I want to encourage everybody in this church right now, keep praying over this church. Keep praying. Let's pray monthly together. Let's believe in the impossible and everything that God is doing for this place. And recently we mentioned about our new building, what we believe God is bringing us to, because we need to make more room for people, clearly. We have overflow in the lobby. We need to make more room for our our youth ministry and our kids ministry and everything that the Lord is doing. There's people traveling here to get baptized. That's happening today. People came from out of state to be baptized here. So God showed us this building and visions and dreams, and we're praying together. And this is so cool. Y'all ready for this? Um, A little over two weeks ago, I told you where we were with the BTI. Since I told you that, we've been able to raise $28,000 more for Believe the Impossible in just a little over two weeks. Let it go up. Let it go up. Let it go up. Here we go. Look at the Lord. Look at what he's doing. And I think we're only, what, 13,000 short of getting to $400,000. Our first goal is raising $750,000. We're already getting there. The Lord is providing. Why? Because you pray. Because you believe. But the thing is, it's not just for the church. It's also for your own life, for the business that God placed in your heart, for the direction that he has for you. He will provide everything you need and push open the doors at the right time. But do you trust him? So you pray, God moves, you move. Will you look to somebody next to you and say that? Pray, God moves, you move. And then that's when we think everything's going to be easy. And then here it comes. You ready? Point number two is the nitty gritty. Here we go. All right. Following the vision will always lead to opposition. Following the vision of the Lord over your life will always lead to opposition. Okay. Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. So I went to the governors of the area west of the Euphrates River and gave them the letters from the king. The king had also sent army officers and soldiers and on horses with me. So the king sent him everything that he needed. But Samballat from Horin and Tobiah the Ammonite official heard about what I was doing. Now listen to this. They were very upset. And they were angry that someone had come to help the Israelites. So let me say it like this. When you pursue the Lord's work, demons are going to come out of other people. When you pursue the Lord's work in your life, demons will start to show up in other people because these people did not want Jerusalem to rebuild the wall. They wanted them always to be vulnerable for attack. See, God is going to deliver you from bondage. God is going to deliver you from addiction. He's going to change your family. But the moment you start to move, that's when the attacks begin. Because now the devil sees, oh, wait a minute. Your life is really about to change. And so he wants to stop the process. And you're going to see demons rise up in other people. Why are you so mad? I'm just doing what God told me to do. But this is another powerful point. Listen to this. Notice when opposition began. Opposition did not begin in the praying stage. Opposition did not begin in the vision stage. Opposition did not begin in the planning stages. Guess when opposition began? When they started to build. When they started to move. When they actually started to get it done. That's when the enemy is going to attack you. That's when it's going to start to get inside of your head. And here's what I love about the story of Nehemiah. Um, Let me say it like this. The devil has no new tricks. Isn't that amazing? And it's amazing because God revealed to us everything the devil will try to do to you and how he will attack you. God also revealed to us the answer how to overcome every single time. You are not defenseless. You have help from the word of God. So let's go into this. I want to show you how the devil attacks when you have a vision from the Lord and how you can overcome. The first attack is this, was to mock and condemn. The first attack was for the enemy to mock and condemn. When Nehemiah gets to Jerusalem, and this is what made him such a good leader, um, a lot of us would get to Jerusalem and say, hey, guys, I've come. I'm here. I got everything we need. Let's go ahead and build the wall and do what we got to do. But he didn't say that. The Bible actually tells us that when Nehemiah got there, he examined the wall by himself first. 
He wanted to see the needs that needed to be done, the tools that needed to be brought in so that the work could be accomplished. He was a godly leader uh, listening to the Lord before he told everybody else around him. And then eventually in Jerusalem, he says, hey, listen, the Lord has brought me here. I got a vision from the Lord. We're going to build this wall together. And they were unified in protecting Jerusalem until, listen, when you start to move, the critics come out. You hear me? When you start to build what God has told you to build, that's when the critics come out. Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 18 through 20. I told them, Nehemiah said, that my God had been so kind to me. I told them what the king had said to me. Then they answered, let's start the work now so that we can begin this good work. Notice the wording here. They said, let's begin this good work in unity to build what God has called us to build. But some people got angry. And Sembalat of Horan and Tobiah, the Ammonite official, and Geshem, the Arab, heard that they were building again. So what did they do? They made fun of us in a very ugly way. Listen to the wording here. And they said, what are you doing? You ever had somebody ask you that? Making you feel dumb for following the Lord? You had a business degree. Why are you going into ministry? What are you doing? The Lord placed this on your heart, and now you're moving states by faith to start something up. What are you doing? You look reckless. You look dumb. What are you doing? How many times have you heard that? From the enemy, they questioned Nehemiah. Why? Because the enemy's strategy is to place doubt inside of your head. If he can make you doubt everything that God has spoken over you, then he knows that maybe he can keep you from moving into the right direction. And so they said, what are you doing? And then he said, are you turning against the king? Again, you're going to see false accusations. False accusations to bring other people into this idea about Nehemiah. But listen to what Nehemiah said, okay? But this is what I said to them. The God of heaven will help us succeed. Succeed. We are God's servants, and we will rebuild the city. You cannot help us in this work because none of your family lived here in Jerusalem. You don't own any of this land, and you have no right to be in this place. In other words, Nehemiah was saying, mind your own business. That's the Bobby translation right there, okay? Mind your own business. Stay out of it. It doesn't involve you then. There are some people so angry and distraught over what the Lord is doing in your life and the blessings that he's bringing into your life that they keep placing themselves where they do not belong, just trying to stand in the way, trying to distract you from everything that the Lord has placed upon you. Because listen, as you grow in the vision, the critics grow too. You got to understand that. As you grow in what the Lord has for you, so do the critics. Their voices will get louder. Because their goal is to get their opinions heard where it should not be heard, to cause division. The devil's mission is to lie and divide every single time. Um, Last week, I said that if you believe his lie, you'll hide. You'll hide away from everything that God has for you. But also, when you believe the lies of the devil, guess what? It's going to cause division. You remember when Jesus was casting out demons out of this man? He healed this man. The Pharisees were there, and they said, this man, this this Jesus gets his power from Satan. And Jesus said, that's dumb. I mean, that's pretty much what he said. He said, that's dumb. Why would Satan cast out his own demons? A kingdom divided against itself will not be able to stand. See, Jesus just gave us a revelation right there of what the enemy wants to do to the church what the enemy wants to do to your family, what the enemy wants to do over a vision that God has placed over your life. If he can lie to you and you start to believe those lies, then everybody gets divided and you go against each other instead of the real enemy. Listen, it is a spiritual fight. Keep trusting the Lord and keep building what he's called you to build. For 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 also states it like this, control yourselves. Be careful. Stop living for the world. I'm getting drunk all the time, intoxicated with the the lusts of the world. Be careful because the devil is your enemy, and he goes around like a roaring lion looking for someone to attack and eat, looking for someone to devour, devour. And here's how the enemy gets inside of your head. He wants you to feel dumb. Ever heard that voice? You start moving for the Lord, and the devil says, you look so dumb right now. Everybody's going to mock you. Everybody's going to make fun of you for doing something this crazy, for believing in God's 
vision. But when someone makes you feel stupid, here it is. Say what Nehemiah said. What did Nehemiah say? He said, this is God's plan. You're making fun of me. I didn't come up with the plan. In fact, God put the burden on my heart. I prayed to him. He made a way. This is God's plan, no matter what you say over my life. So here it is. Let me encourage you today. Your job is to work on the mission of God, not to convince your critics you're a good person. Your job is to do the work of the Lord, not to convince your critics you're a good person. Because the more work you do for God, the more critics come up. You cannot just listen to their voice. You got to listen to the voice of God over theirs. Stop letting their lies upset you. Like, I know it's difficult and it's hard and it can be devastating sometimes. And you know the right thing and you know the truth of God's word. But sometimes you just see those little remarks and you just want to say something. You just want to comment back, right? Because what do they do? A lot of us say, well, that just ruined my day. Don't give them that power to ruin the day that God created for you to do a mission for his kingdom. Don't give them that power to allow them to run through your mind to over and over again. For when you see them, you can be like, hey, I hope everything's good. Because I know that God has healed me. I don't hold anything against you. But you keep moving into what the Lord has for you. See, they want you to believe the lies. They want other people to believe the lies as well. Um, notice this too. Critics never know the full story. Here's what they said to Nehemiah. This is very foolish. Verse 19, what did they say? You are rebelling against the king. That is dumb. That was a dumb thing to say because it was an ignorant accusation. Why? Because Nehemiah got permission from the king to do this. It was the king that sent Nehemiah there and gave him everything that he needed to build the wall. So everything that they spoke was a lie. They lied to divide. Don't let it get to you. God is going to protect you. He is going to guard you. Now, listen to this, though. Here's the second attack. This one seems a little harder, but God will give you strength. Since Nehemiah ignored them, they teamed up against him. Okay, let me say it like this. When you ignore the few critics in your life, trust me, they're going to recruit others. <laughs> they're going to recruit others to come into your life and also speak very loudly against you to try to stop you from what you're doing. Why? Because if the enemy cannot control you, they're going to control what others think about you. If you're not enslaved to them and you've been set free because of Jesus Christ and you continue working on the project that God has given you, then since they can't control you, they're going to control what other people think about your character, what other people think about what you're doing, and they're going to spread all these lies again to divide. That's okay. But pastor, that hurts. It does. Um, we talked not that long ago about a pruning process. Um, sometimes God is going to take people out of your way, out of your life, in order for you to grow. The thing about a pruning process, it doesn't always mean that those people were toxic. Sometimes they're just not meant for the promise in the end. But a godly friend of mine also spoke to me and meant a lot to me about a purging process as well. And the difference between pruning and purging is that purging, it usually happens all at once. It's almost like vomiting out what is toxic in your life. And so there's going to be sometimes you're going to see maybe a group of people coming up against you or even leaving in that moment because God is getting rid of the toxicity that is in your life, stopping you from building what God called you to build. So it's amazing to understand that God is still in control and he's still working things out for you to succeed in the end, meaning, yes, it's going to hurt. But just trust God. Trust God when they leave. And trust that God maybe can even bring them back at the right time if they're meant to be in the promise. Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 7 and 8. But Sambalat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the men from Ashdod were very angry. For they heard that the people continued working on the walls of Jerusalem. They were saying, how dare them? We try to stop them. They heard our voices. They heard our complaints. They still want to build the wall. Okay, I see how it is. They heard the people were repairing the holes in the wall. So here it is. All the men got together. All the enemies got together, and they made plans against Jerusalem. They planned to stir up trouble against Jerusalem. They planned to come and fight against the city. What would you do? 
What would you do if a group came against you? What would you do if a group of people came to attack your character, came to attack your business? What would you do if a group of people came to attack even your family, your safety, and your well-being? Do you keep following the vision or do you just give up because the enemy is scary? God is always going to work things out. And even in the trial, you may ask God, God, why? Lord, I'm just trying to do the right thing. You gave me this vision. I'm trying to do the right thing. Why are so many coming up against me? So let me say it like this. If the devil is bringing you a fight, it's because there was something significant on the other side. You hear me? The fights in your life right now are because there's something significant on the other side. God is leading you to something that's going to free you. And it's going to change your family and change other people. So the devil's putting up a fight. You need to recognize that the fight means you're going the right direction. And stop falling down and bowing down to the enemy. And bow down in prayer to the Lord God instead. And call upon his name. For again, prayer will relieve your stress. Mm. But here's, here's what's kind of crazy. Um, the building project to save them from attacks is actually causing an attack. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? Um, but here's a PowerPoint for you. The enemy's threats were empty. The enemy's threats, everything that they spoke against them, were empty. They did nothing about it. They were talk, 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 talk to scare, but they never attacked. You want to know why they never attacked? Because Nehemiah said, that's okay. We're going to pray together. We're going to armor up. We're going to armor up in the Lord because he understood that God puts a hedge of protection around you when you're doing the will of God. I love this. Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 15 through 17. Then our enemies heard that we knew about their plan. See, God will always reveal what the enemy's doing. And they knew that God ruined their plans. I love that. So we all went back to work on the wall. Everyone went back to their own place, and they did their part from that day on. Half of the men worked on the wall. The other half of the men were on guard. Listen to this. Ready with spears, shields, bows, and armor. Verse 17, the builders and their helpers had a tool in one hand and a weapon in the other hand. I need you to understand the same thing happens to you spiritually. There is a hedge of protection when you do the will of God. You can't see it, but holy angels are encamped all around you. And they're guarding you from the demonic attacks that want to come against you. You may think it's a regular day, but you have no clue the spiritual battle that took place. How the angels are fighting for you. But listen, when you build, always carry the sword of the Spirit. Never put it down. The Word of God. And so the last attack kind of made me laugh. The last attack from the enemy was to distract. And not only did he try to distract Nehemiah from building the wall, but then later he also gives false prophecy. They spoke false prophecy because they wanted to encourage Nehemiah to go run and hide. But Nehemiah knew the word of the Lord, and he called them out. And the Holy Spirit will do the same for you. See, the Holy Spirit, one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit is discernment of evil spirits. And so you can tell when an evil spirit is lying through somebody because you already know the promises of God. So instead of hiding, you can trust God through the process. But I love, listen, I love how Nehemiah replied back to the enemy. Maybe you want to write this down today. Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 2 and 3. So Sam Ballot and Geshem sent a message asking me to meet them at one of the villages in the plain of Ono. Listen to this. But I realized they were plotting to harm me. Understand wisdom there. Not everybody who wants to meet with you is for you. Some people want to meet with you just to attack you and put you down and control the next decision you make. Isn't it crazy that some people that come up against you all of a sudden like, hey, let's meet. Let's, let's, let's get together. Why? Because when they get together with you, they want something from you. They want to control you. He recognized the attack that was coming in the plane of, oh, no, oh, no. Okay, so, but it's, I'm sorry, but... Uh, Listen, he said, but I realized they were plotting to harm me. So I replied by sending this message to them. I am engaged in a great work. I can't come. He said, why should I stop working to come meet with you? I love that. Like, did you hear what he said? He said, 
I am doing a great work for the Lord. Why should I stop to come meet with you right now? Imagine writing that to somebody that you know is trying to attack you. That's why they want to get together. No, I'm doing the work of the Lord right now. You're trying to hinder me. You're trying to stop me. You're trying to place doubt inside of my head. So I'm going to keep building what God has called me to build instead. Now, this also made me laugh four times. They sent the same message. So four times I gave them the same reply. I am busy doing the work of the Lord. And this brings me to my last point of the message, which is this. Keep focusing on the vision. Keep focusing on the vision. Um, again, the hardest battles you will face when it comes to spiritual maturity are the battles within. The battles over your identity in Christ, where you're going in life, who you are. We try to get our value from so many other things. And, and I realize we get excited about a vision, but it's the middle that's hard. What do I mean by that? Okay, let me clarify. When you receive a vision from God, it's exciting. In the very beginning, you're like, all right, God, you're going to do something really big in my life. And at the end of the vision, it's really exciting because, hey, it came to pass and it's actually taking place. And you're pumped up about it. But I need you to understand it's the middle. It's the middle that can be so difficult and hard sometimes. Listen, keep listening. It's the middle that can sometimes make you feel stuck in the situation like everything is falling apart. And it's the middle that sometimes that can make you feel discouraged. God, I, I started, but I'm not there yet. I'm tired now. Things are falling apart. There's a lot of trash in my life that I got to move around. God, I just don't know if I have the strength to keep doing this. And every time I do this, the enemies keep coming up against me. It's the middle that really starts to test your faith. What are you going to do when the enemy comes in? See, before they armored up, the people of Jerusalem became very discouraged over everything happening. Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 10 and 11. And so at that time, the people of Judah said, the workers are becoming tired. There's too much dirt and trash in the way. We cannot continue to build the wall. And our enemies are saying, before the Jews know it or see us, we'll be right there among them and we'll kill them and we'll stop the work. That's what it feels like in the middle. Tired, hurt, and attacked. But I want you to hear the words of Nehemiah, and I pray that you apply it to your life and your situation right now. Verse 14, Nehemiah said, don't be afraid of our enemies. Remember the Lord, who is great and powerful. You must fight, listen to the wording here, you must fight for your brothers. You must fight for your sons and your daughters. You must fight for your wives and your homes. You can't give up on the vision because this affects your family. This affects your future. This affects everything that God is calling you into. Do it for your family. Do it for your children. Do it for your spouse. Don't give up. And I realized what Nehemiah was saying is when you feel stuck in the middle and you want to quit, remember what God has already done to bring you here. For God had freed the Israelites out of the land of Egypt from slavery. God had directed Joshua to bring them into the promised land. Even after 70 years of captivity, God had freed them. Everything that he spoke over their life, it seemed impossible. Jerusalem became a ghost town. And God revived it because his words said that he would. His promises always come. Remember everything that God has done to bring us here today. Let's keep building. When you lose focus on the vision, remember what God has already done to bring you here today. They remembered. And because they remembered, that's why they armored up and they finished the wall. I love this. Nehemiah 6, 15 and 16. It had taken 52 days to finish building the wall. Then all of our enemies heard that we had completed the wall. Here it is. And all the nations around us saw that it was finished. So they lost their courage. The enemy lost their ambition to fight, to attack when they saw that it was built. Because they understood that this work had been done with the help of God. Keep building what the Lord has called you to build. 
Because when the enemy sees it, they'll lose their confidence and realize, oh, God did this. You really did hear from the Lord. God is really moving in your life. I want to encourage you today, listen, don't walk away from the vision that God has placed over your life. Let me remind you again, do it for your sons. Do it for your daughters. Do it for your wives. Do it for your homes. Do it for the destiny and the calling that God has for your life. You need to grow in the vision and keep building what God has called you to build. I'm going to have you stand up right here. And very quickly, I want to recap the steps and see in freedom and growing in the vision. The first thing, comfort is a deception keeping you from what God has for your life. The second thing is this, you cannot accomplish a godly vision if you do not spend time in prayer. Hearing the word of the Lord and doing the Lord's work will bring out demons and other people, but it's okay. Your job is to do the mission of God not to convince your critics you're a good person. But when you lose focus of the vision in the middle, remember what God has already done to bring you here today. And so I'm gonna ask you to be very bold right now. If you feel like giving up on the vision, will you just raise your hand right now? It's okay, I see you, I see you. If you feel like you just wanna give up right now on some things that God has told you to do, if you feel lost with the vision and direction of your life, will you raise your hand? God, I pray right now in Jesus' name, make it clear. Let us be able to write on on tablets, Father. Let us be able to write it down clearly what it is that you have for us, where you're guiding us. And let us move past our burdens of past mistakes and insecurities and addictions from the past. Let us be free in Jesus' name. Let us continue to build. Holy Spirit, move in us and move on those watching online today. They feel like just giving up on their marriage, feel like giving up on their life even. God, I pray that you just bring them hope by the Spirit of God, by your Spirit, O Lord, today to keep building everything that you've called them to build. There is something significant on the other side. Don't you dare give up. I pray in Jesus' name. God, give them the strength to not give up. For the promise of your word still stands. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen, amen, amen. Can we just give a shout of praise to the Lord? Hey guys, it's Pastor Bobby Chandler, and I just want to say thank you so much for watching today's message. We pray that it blessed your life, but do me a favor, before you just click off of YouTube, make sure you subscribe to our channel, and also ring that bell so that you get notifications on the next sermon or any announcements that we have going on. I also want to say thank you for being a faithful partner with Authentic Church, because of your giving, we are able to bless and impact the people around us every single week. So, we love our Authentic family, and thank you today for joining us.